it's very very important disease most of the times it comes in as a acute conditions and uh, it comes as a emergency situations okay it's like a, a intestinal representation of uh, ischemic related infarction okay so before going to the lecture we will discuss some terminologies okay inshallah after this lecture you can able to define the terminologies such as hernia intestinal adhesions intussusception valvulus okay these are the terminologies inshallah we will be explaining and then you guys can able to explain the pathogenesis and morphology of hirschsprung disease hirschsprung disease it's a very important disease which commonly seen in the children neonates and you can able to explain the pathogenesis of ischemic bowel disease what happens in ischemia what happens in ischemia and you can able to correlate and analyze the morphological changes in various causes of ischemic bowel disease there are different causes for the ischemic bowel disease and it is very very important to identify so that you can prevent them occurring again you can prevent them it happens again so it's very important and let us go into the terminology first see the intestinal obstruction is most commonly seen in small intestine most commonly it involves small intestine that is jejunum ileum and jejunum are most commonly involved so there are four terminologies can uh, i'm going to explain which can produce intestinal obstruction which can produce intestinal obstruction these are the major causes for intestinal obstruction major causes for intestinal obstruction hernias intestinal adhesions intussusception and valvulus and valvulus so hernia means any weakness or defect in the wall of the peritoneal cavity okay if the the in the abdominal wall if there is any defect any weakness then the intestine can protrude outside can protrude outside or it comes out it comes out that is may permit protrusion of a serosa lined pouch of peritoneum okay you all know the intestines are covered by peritoneum right okay now we have a abdominal cavity okay abdominal wall so if the abdominal wall is weak okay for example umbilical area is the area where there is weakness okay so in that weakness the peritoneum can protrude into the umbilicus can protrude into the umbilicus and when the peritoneum is protruding then the some part of the intestine also comes out some part of the intestine also comes so this is called hernia this is called hernia and most commonly you can i can give example it is called umbilical hernia it comes to the umbilicus it is called umbilical hernia okay now next is adhesions adhesions means the intestines are coiled okay they are coiled together and for example uh, the two intestinal wall should not attach together should not attach together because if it is get attached the peristalsis will not happen the peristalsis intestinal movement will not happen so normally it will not happen okay so if there is any infection or any inflammation especially serositis okay serosa going for inflammation and peritonitis the peritoneum going for inflammation then it will end up with fibrosis it will end up with fibrosis when the fibrosis happens it will get attached fibrosis happens it gets attached so adhesions is uh, due to development of fibrosis due to inflammation leads to adhesion adhesion means sticking together adhesion means sticking together and between the bowel segments commonly happens between the bowel segments or with the abdominal wall or with the operation sites okay when you do for example nowadays they do laparotomy okay so they put a hole they send the camera inside the abdominal cavity and they see what is there in the intestine if we cannot able to diagnose by imaging <coughs> so we do a laparotomy we explore the abdominal cavity we explore the abdominal cavity so when you are doing you are going to move the organs here and there inside okay so there is a method but i'm just i'm telling it very easy for you so we move the organs okay to see what is there so that time if you have cause minor injuries it you should be very careful when you are doing laparotomy if you cause any injuries that can in, that can cause fibrosis that can cause fibrosis and that leads to additions that leads to additions therapeutic induced additions okay 
is operation induced surgery induced additions are very common surgery induced additions are very common even the cesarean section when you when you deliver the baby due to surgery by a lower segmental cesarean section lscs we call so that time when you remove when you are that's what you should not touch the other areas okay just go to the uterus put the incision in the uterus remove the baby close it so when you are going inside you should not touch any organ when you are coming out you should not touch any organ if you touch any organ that will create addition that will create addition understand so that will cause small injuries that will create addition so that is called addition now i, have, I hope you understood herniation herniation means there is weakness in the abdominal wall okay that allows the peritoneum to herniate okay peritoneum to protrude along with some part of the intestine along with some part of the intestine that is called herniation that is called herniation okay then we discussed about addition addition means fibrosis okay so fibrosis mass commonly seen in inflammation if it is a disease state if it is a disease and therapeutic induced are very common operation or surgical induced additions are very common okay, now coming to the another concept called valvulus it is called valvulus see valvulus yani it is twisting of a loop of bowl okay the loop of bowl gets twisted like this so usually it happens at the mesenteric point of attachment then when the mesentery attaches to it that is the area where it can go for uh, twisting it is termed as valvulus it results in both luminal and vascular compromise okay what happens here is when the bowl goes for twisting like this the blood supply enters through the serosa the blood supply enters through the mesentery to the serosa so that also goes for twisting so the blood vessel gets blocked the blood vessel gets blocked so it will go for ischemia it will go for ischemia valvulus is very dangerous because the intestine this segment will go for ischemia this segment will go for ischemia ischemia will leads to severe hypoxia hypoxia will leads to necrosis that is called infarction that is called infarction okay now coming to another concept called intussusception intussusception okay intussusception when a segment of intestine enters we call telescoping for example this is one segment and this is another segment which enters into the lower segment okay it is called telescoping so this is called intussusception it is called intussusception very very important it is very commonly seen in children that's why if you see our grandmothers they tell not to uh, take the child and put in the air and catch okay because it goes for i don't know what to call in arabic actually every language has this uh, some terminology for this okay so it is called intussusception if you ask your grandmother or your mother they may know it okay so this is very commonly they tell okay they, they in, in my language they say that uh, intestine going into the intestine okay so this is called intussusception very commonly seen in children very commonly seen in children so this is very very important and because a child cannot go for acute obstruction the child will go for acute obstruction child will keep on crying and it will not take any milk it will not take any milk and uh, unreasonable cry you cannot reason out why there is cry so that is the scenario will be when the patient comes to you when the mother brings the child okay now uh, what i am doing is here itself i am giving the page number okay so uh, you have to go on read okay so we are not covering all the things in the robins for intestines we are covering the most important one so that's why i am giving page number when on, in the slides itself <coughs> not at the end and also i given the page number but uh, you can refer to the page number directly here okay now coming to the another concept very important concept is it okay no uh, go go for the ninth edition and uh, and if you ask me i have to say you have to go for the ninth edition okay you can discuss with me afterwards okay because it is getting recorded okay so now uh, now uh, coming to the point hirschsprung disease it's very very important. let me finish anil because i'll take questions in the end so uh, write the questions if you have anything if you if you feel like it is very important you cannot understand anything after that then you can ask 
Okay, now coming to the Hirschsprung disease. It is congenital disease. It is congenital disease, which means it is present after birth. It presents after birth, which means neonates are affected. First year, the child in first year of life, it gets affected. It's very very important, and it is defect in the colonic innervation. Innervation means the nerve. Okay, the you know, uh, I think Dr. Matthew would have discussed about uh, submucosal nerve plexus and the my mesenteric and myenteric nerve plexus right mm -hmm. so it's very very important so there is some problem in that plexus there is no problem in the nerve plexus the ganglion cells is not there absence of ganglion cells absence of ganglion cells okay if there is absence of ganglion cells there will not be intestinal movement the intestinal movement will be absent intestinal movement will be absent See, commonly seen in males, but if it comes in females, it will be very severe. If it comes in females, it will be very severe. And postnatal period, the child cannot pass the meconium. Usually, when the when the after the child is born, okay, the fecus by the child first period of life, it is called meconium. It is called meconium. So this meconium, child cannot pass the meconium. Okay, so child cannot defecate. Child cannot defecate. So complication it will leads to enterocolitis, fluid electrolyte imbalance, and perforation and peritonitis. Perforation and peritonitis. For example, this this is for example this is a segment which doesn't have ganglion, which doesn't have ganglion. So this segment cannot move. This segment. Cannot move. Okay. Now consider there is some segment above. Okay. Now segment above that has ganglion. That has ganglion. So intestinal movement happens there. So if anything happen, food is taken, it comes down. Okay. Now this area cannot move. Okay. This act like obstruction. This act like a obstruction. So the proximal segment dilates. The proximal segment. Dilates. So this is very very important concept in Hirschsprung disease. The distal segment. the affected segment will not have peristalsis will not have peristalsis the segment above the affected segment the segment above the affected segment will go for dilation will go for dilation is very very important because you are seeing here the affected segment see this is enema okay barium enema inshallah dr iskandar will take about imaging in gat so now we use a barium Okay, to im to uh, image the intestines. To image the intestines, we give barium meal. Okay, we ask us to uh, ask the ask the patient to eat the barium meal to take the upper GI. To take the upper GI. To lower GI, we insert the enema in the through the anus. Okay, so then we can uh, see the lower GI. So so we can see the lower GI. So what you are seeing here is. affected segment here you are seeing the dilated segment okay so it's very very important so what is the pathogenesis the neuronal plexus actually develops from the neuronal crest cells okay we are giving some basics here the neuronal plexus that is N the gat neuronal plexus develops from the neural crest cells that migrate into the bowel wall during embryogenesis during embryogenesis the neural crest cell will migrate to the bowel wall if that migration is some having problem then the bowel wall will not have neuronal plexus so that's why hirschsprung disease is also known as congenital a ganglionic megacolon so this is called megacolon the dilated colon is called megacolon it is happening due to a ganglionic here happening due to a ganglionic here so it is from the birth it is congenital a ganglionic megacolon results when the normal migration of neural crest cells from cecum to rectum is disrupted usually it affects the rectum and sigmoid colon usually it affects the rectum and sigmoid colon remember it can be involved from cecum to rectum cecum to rectum so the this produces distal intestinal segment lacks both Meissner submucosal plexus and Auerbach myenteric plexus. So this is the plexus Dr. Matthew has taken. I saw his handout. Okay. 
you have to be very thorough with this plexus this is called brain of the gi tract this is called brain of the gi tract you should be thorough you should understood completely because many drugs we are going to deal with this okay so please understand so this plexus will not be there this plexus is absent in hirschsprung disease this plexus is absent so peristaltic contraction are absent there is no peristalsis so what happened they go for functional obstruction then dilation of the proximal to the affected segment affected uh, proximal segment which uh, goes for dilation okay so what happens is commonly seen in rectum followed by more seen in the sigmoid colon okay more commonly it involves the rectum and followed by sigmoid colon then if it is very severe it can affect all the colon it can affect all the colon remember proximal segment goes for dilation proximal segment goes for dilation and so what they do is they take a biopsy or they cut the affected segment okay they are sometimes if the, the the proximal segment is too much dilated they remove that also they remove that also so they give the dilated and the affected segment to histopathology okay so what we do is we take uh, two pieces of tissue from the affected segment from the dilated segment so which segment will have ganglion mashallah uh, dilated segment will have ganglion and affected segment will not have ganglion so that confirms it is hirschsprung disease that confirms it is hirschsprung disease so diagnosis requires demonstration of absence of ganglion cells in the affected segment <clears throat> now let us go into the ischemic bowel disease you all know the infarction happens when there is ischemia right ischemia leads to infarction ischemia leads to infarction okay this is the basic fundamental we studied in the pod okay now there are three types of infarction happens in the intestines one is mucosal infarction which means the mucosa alone goes for infarct mucosa alone goes for infarction and if submucosa as well as some part of the muscle layer is involved it is called mural infarction if all the walls are involved the complete intestinal wall is involved it is called transmural infarction it is called transmural infarction see even in the uh, myocardial infarction we had this classification subendocardial infarction transmural infarction even in the uh, myocardial infarction we classified it okay likewise all the organs we classify like this whether it is mucosal here it is mucosal mural transmural there are three types of infarction all three three has different reasons all these three has different reasons now if there is hypoperfusion hypoperfusion comes in septicemia shock okay any accident trauma dehydration all this leads to hypoperfusion it may be acute or chronic which leads to mucosal infarction please understand so hypoperfusion leads to mucosal infarction okay now acute vascular obstruction okay thromboembolism atherosclerosis these are all acute vascular obstruction they will immediately block the blood vessel they will immediately block the blood vessel that can come from the aortic aneurysm cardiac thrombi oral contraceptives hypercoagulable states so these are the conditions can cause acute vascular obstruction these are the conditions cause acute vascular obstruction that will usually produce transmural infarction that will usually produce transmural infarction very very important because if the somebody is having some thrombi in the heart okay we discuss okay uh, systemic embolism we discussed in the say pod you should never forget in your life if you go to the hemodynamic chapter we discuss about embolism in that we discuss about two types of embolism what are they no one can answer what are the different types of embolism we discuss systemic embolism and pulmonary embolism and pulmonary embolism so systemic embolism the thrombi origins from the heart the thrombi origins from the heart so if there is thrombi in the heart 
it breaks and it enters the systemic circulation it can block anywhere in the systemic circulation it can block anywhere in the systemic circulation if it goes and blocking in the mesenteric vessels or celiac trunk it will produce ischemia of intestine it will produce ischemia of intestine so that's what it leads to acute vascular obstruction that will produce transmural infarction that will produce transmural infarction so intestinal ischemia has two phases it has two phase one is the first phase is hypoxic injury hypoxic injury so then if you give back the blood okay then second phase starts it is called reperfusion injury because of giving the blood it produce injury it produce injury it is reperfusion injury this both we discussed in detail in the cellular injury chapter cellular injury chapter you should know about in details of it okay now you should know intestinal vascular anatomy which itself contributes to ischemia which itself contributes to ischemia the arrangement of the vasculature itself contributes to ischemia so there is a area called watershed area there is a area called watershed area which means they are normally hypoperfused area normally hypoperfused area so these are the two areas which is normally hypoperfused okay which is less blood supply normally they have less blood supply one is in the splenic flexure one is in the splenic flexure and other one is in the recto sigmoid junction other one is in the recto sigmoid junction this is normally hypoperfused normally hypoperfused okay i give you a scenario for example a person has severe hypovolemia okay due to some burn injury or due to some dehydration or due to severe diarrhea or due to some accident he lost blood so his blood volume is reduced his plasma volume is reduced so he is hypovolemic state he is hypovolemic state so this segments will affected more this segment will be affected more because they are normally hypoperfused if still hypoperfusion immediately affect them very little change in the hypovolemia will affect this segment so this is called water shed area this is called water shed area okay very very important so water shed if the infarction happens in this area we have to correct the hypovolemia we have to correct the hypovolemia so this is called water shed bowel infarct water shed bowel infarct even in the brain it happens okay in the brain there is water shed areas inshallah we'll discuss when you go to the cns so in the bowel there are two areas okay you should know that is splenic flexure and other one is recto sigmoid junction other one is recto sigmoid junction normally hypoperfusion okay i don't want to go into the detail why it is normally hypoperfused if anybody interested you can search and learn if you have doubt you can come and ask me because if i take that itself two hours lecture okay now you have to understand it is normally hypoperfused it is normally hypoperfused which means the blood going to them is less the blood going to them is less but it is adequate but it is adequate okay so if it is not adequate it will cause normal ischemia because normal ischemia cannot happen ischemia is pathology understand so no, normally hypoperfused but adequate but adequate okay now what happens is if the person going for hypovolemia if the person going for hypovolemia this areas are first affected this areas are first affected so when you see a person coming complaining of lower abdominal pain lower abdominal pain so and he is of around old age okay and he is having some dehydration immediately you should understand there is some problem happening in the recto sigmoid junction there is some problem happening in the <coughs> recto sigmoid junction okay now histologically if you see the blood supply goes into the villi goes into the villi it makes a hairpin bend and comes out it makes a hairpin bend and comes out so the mucosa the mucosa when they have a hairpin bend that area the blood is not coming very fast the blood is not coming very fast because of the architecture because of the or because for example you are driving a car in the u turn you cannot drive very fast okay you have to slow down okay so likewise the fluid also slows down the fluid also slows down so that mucosa normally has less blood supply 
okay weaker blood supply so that's why hairpin bend of the intestinal capillary capillaries will create chance for more ischemia will create chance for more ischemia so ischemic injury to the surface epithelium is more common ischemic injury to the surface epithelium is more common and alhamdulillah the crypts the crypts means for example this is the villi okay these are the called crypts this area is called crypts okay this area has stem cells this area has stem cells so the blood supply to the stem cells is good the blood supply towards the crypt is good so that's why anything damage happens here the stem cell stem cells can grow back the stem cells can proliferate they bring back the epithelium they bring back the epithelium so once again i'm telling see in the villi the blood supply enters the capillary centers they come out like a u shape come out like a u turn hairpin bend come out like a hairpin bend so the blood supply goes down and goes above and slows down slows down so the mucosal surface epithelium can have ischemia can go for ischemia but in the crypt in the crypts there are stem cells that is not affected that is not affected so it's very very important that's why our intestinal epithelium can regenerate can regenerate if the crypts are destroyed the intestinal epithelium cannot regenerate cannot regenerate so it will go for complete fibrosis it will go for complete fibrosis okay now coming to the concept called inflammation due to ischemia is called ischemic colitis inflammation due to ischemia is called ischemic colitis and generally generalized hypotension or hypoxemia can cause local injury and cause ischemic disease and differential diagnosis is any infection causing some colitis okay any infection causing colitis is a dd differential diagnosis and usually it is seen in the splenic flexure or rectosigmoid colon i explained why it happens right why it is happened in splenic flexure and why it is happened the rectosigmoid colon why because of hypo normo hypoperfusion because of normo hypoperfusion and morphology if you see the vascular anatomy which protects the crypt vascular anatomy protects the crypt so which contains the epithelial stem cells which contains the epithelial stem cells so that can repopulate that can regenerate the surface that can regenerate the surface so usually surface epithelium goes for atrophy or necrosis and slowly sloughing means what they fall down they fall they fall off and then you can see hyper proliferative crypts hyper proliferative crypts this is the morphological signature of ischemic intestinal disease it is a characteristic feature of ischemic intestinal disease what is the characteristic feature the mucosal surface is dead necrotic and it's sloughed sloughed means fall off and the lower crypt cells will go for hyper proliferation will go for hyper proliferation okay now clinical features it comes commonly in the old age and they have some existing cardiac or vascular disease they have existing cardiac or vascular disease it can be acute if it is acute they produce bloody diarrhea very dark brown to stool dark brown melanotic stool and bowel sounds will be very less so differential diagnosis you should think of acute appendicitis perforated ulcer acute cholecystitis then ischemic bowel disease then ischemic bowel disease this all comes in a condition called acute abdomen this all comes in a condition called acute abdomen very serious problem the patient cannot tolerate very patient cannot tolerate so they have very severe acute pain okay and they cannot they actually they will be uh, uh, coiled themselves like a worm understand so they cannot tolerate and immediately you have to take him to the emergency so if you see them in the emergency four conditions we have to rule out one is acute appendicitis or perforated ulcer or acute cholecystitis and ischemic bowel disease and ischemic bowel disease other conditions which produce ischemic colitis is cytomegalovirus infection cytomegalovirus infection why it is important why it is important 
why cytomegalovirus infection can produce ischemic bowel disease we discussed in the esophagus cytomegalovirus infects which cell you have to study actually understand if you are not studying we cannot do anything okay so learning from your side teaching is we are doing cytomegalovirus infects the endothelial cells infects the endothelial cells endothelial cells is a blood cells right blood vessel cell so if it goes for infection it gets damaged so automatically the blood flow will be affected the blood flow will be affected okay then why in radiation it is affecting the it producing ischemia why radiation producing ischemia i thought you people know huh? not destroy the epithelial cells what i told even i discussed in the esophagus it causes thickening of blood vessel it causes thickening of blood vessel so thickening of blood vessel will not allow them to have enough perfusion enough perfusion and necrotizing enterocolitis is a infection which can damage the blood vessels and other area so that can produce necrosis and angiodysplasia is another condition which can produce <coughs> ischemic bowel disease so these are the at least you should know this four conditions which is commonly causes ischemic bowel disease so now coming to the last slide i think it is called hemorrhoids hemorrhoids means it's a dilated anal and pre perianal collateral blood vessels okay what happens is it happens due to some job related long uh, long standing and the pressure comes to the down side blood vessels so it goes for dilation it goes for dilation and most commonly seen in portal hypertension patient it most commonly seen in portal hypertension patient inshallah that will be our separate lecture portal hypertension is very very important it comes in alcoholic patient and liver cirrhosis the portal vein goes for hypertension that will leads to uh, dilation of anal and perianal blood vessels anal and perianal blood vessels what we do is if you do a colonoscopy the blood vessels will protrude into the colonoscopy like a strawberry it gives like a strawberry appearance okay here it is four there are different grades of hemorrhoids okay here this is called it is normally it, it is it is called external hemorrhoid which is happening within the inferior hemorrhoid plexus if it is happening within the inferior hemorrhoid plexus it is called external hemorrhoid if it happens in the superior hemorrhoid plexus it is called internal hemorrhoid internal hemorrhoid will be seen inside the distal to the rectum okay here it is seen in the anal area it is seen in the anal area understand so this is the dilated blood vessels this is the dilated blood vessels this is internal this is internal hemorrhoid so even in the pregnancy it happens Pre pregnancy it will happen but it will not be very severe it will not be very severe what no no it's not like that okay so because it depends upon if she, if she had in the first pregnancy high chance to have in the second pregnancy understand if she is not having the first pregnancy doesn't mean that she will not have in the second pregnancy you understand so in pregnancy it is expected depends upon the uh, many factors okay inshallah that we will discuss in the gu2 okay now you have to understand in pregnancy physiologically it can happen but it once the delivery happens it 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 subs, it, it it goes off it goes off the problem here is most commonly it is a sign of portal hypertension most commonly it is a sign of portal hypertension that is most dangerous and any increased abdominal pressure okay that can cause hemorrhoids that can cause hemorrhoids a chronic constipation Co chronic constipation that's why they tell to eat high fiber diet okay if you eat low fiber diet okay your stool production is less stool production is less it will produce constipation that will create more pressure so that will leads to hemorrhoids that will leads to hemorrhoids okay so yeah yeah so you see any whether she had hemorrhoid before pregnancy or during the pregnancy 
so the most common symptom is pain and bleeding most common symptom is pain and bleeding so usually if they use the toilet paper they see a fresh blood they see a so usually the patient complains of they say that i see fresh blood in the toilet paper so that will be the complaint so it is a very clear cut case that fresh blood seen in the toilet paper immediately we will think of hemorrhoid immediately we will think of hemorrhoid or peri the other conditions like perianal fistula perianal ulcers that all the things can cause fresh blood so what is the treatment is now we have lot of treatment previously we used to remove this vessel by incisions okay we remove this uh, dilated vessels so but actually now we have laser therapy okay so in 30 minutes they are finishing the surgery okay so this is about hemorrhoids actually it is nothing but it's a dilated anal and perianal collateral blood vessels it's a dilation of the anal and perianal collateral blood vessels due to the pressure in the venous system due to the pressure in the portal venous system or if there is intra abdominal pressure it could be pregnancy or tumor or any other thing can produce intra abdominal pressure there are two types of hemorrhoids external hemorrhoids and internal hemorrhoids external hemorrhoids involve the inferior hemorrhoid plexus and uh, in internal hemorrhoids involve the superior hemorrhoid plexus okay the most commonest complaint will be of usually they see a fresh blood in the uh, toilet paper so this is what and you have to read from this pages okay actually i given the relevant page numbers okay if you read from that page numbers also it's enough okay so some of the pictures are not given in the robins okay some of the pictures i took it for you to understand about watershed areas and other things so to make it concepts more easier okay so any doubt in this lecture yeah intersusception intersusception means this is the intestine due to very aggressive peristaltic movement this part of the intestine enters into the lower segment enters into the lower segment you see there so because of aggressive peristalsis because of aggressive peristalsis suddenly that enters into the lower segment lower segment it is called telescoping of upper segment into the lower segment telescoping of upper segment into the lower segment so this is called intersusception this is called intersusception for example a person is having a tumor here okay that affects the peristalsis so that segment enters into the lower segment okay so there are many reasons one of the most commonest reason is the tumors the tumors will cause intersusception any other doubts <coughs>